a blessing into us. Amen? I believe that. I believe that in all my heart. I, I, I pastored this church uh, in 1993 to around the year 2000. And a uh, lot of fond memories here. And, and uh, God, God touched us and ministered to me and my family. And, uh, you know, it was a struggle. The church uh, struggled to, to hold on. But uh, you know what? This church is still here. Uh, this church is still holding on. God's got a plan. God's got a plan. God's got a purpose. And so we just thank God for that tonight. That He's got something something amazing in store for the, uh, the Smyrna Church of God. And I just thank God for what He's doing here. We felt led to come back. We, had, we were going to another church. And uh, matter of fact, I had I had been out of church. I backslid on the Lord and uh, and was out of church about ten years. And uh, I had I said I won't preach uh, anymore, and I'm not going to go back to the church of God. But you know what? God made a liar out of me. <laughs> he made a liar out of me. And so God was merciful to me. He brought me back in May of uh, 2014. He brought me back and delivered me and uh, re restored me back into the family of God. And I'll never forget the day me and my wife on a Saturday. God done a wonderful work in my in my life. And it was just it was amazing, the grace of God. You know, God's love. God's love is goes beyond anything we can comprehend. You think you've extended his love and his grace beyond what it can be extended, and yet you find out that that, that you can't. You can't, you can't, you can't. And you you think that that, uh, that you've gone to the point of where there's no coming back, but God brings you back. And if you open your heart and if you'll listen to Him and receive uh, the invitation, if He, if, when He speaks to your heart, if you will receive the invitation and you'll obey, because no man can come to the Father except the Spirit draws Him. We don't get, we don't get saved, uh, receive anything from God on our own. We. Uh, receive it uh, as the Spirit of God speaks to our heart and touches us. So I thank God tonight that I believe He's speaking to us tonight and He's going to speak to us in this service tonight and that He's going to uh, that He's going to the table, I'd like to say I believe the table is spread tonight for us, for us to eat coming down. I believe that God's table is spread and that He's saying come and Fellowship with me, communion with me. And as David said, the table was spread before him. He said, my cup run up over. He anointed my head with oil. And so I believe that tonight that God, as he said, to, as Jesus said to the church in Revelations, how that he said, behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if any man will open the door, I will come in and sup with him and he with me. So I think tonight the table is spread and Jesus is saying, come. Coming, coming down. So I thank God for that tonight. And uh, let's look, uh, using the start out for just a scripture text. And I, I you know, as a, as a minister, you uh, you try to formulate and pray and, and draw up an outline. But, uh, you know, at the same time, you want to follow the Spirit of God. And so, uh, so I'm open to the flow of God's Spirit. I don't want to be bound by a three-point outline, so to speak. That's all, you know, it's all well and good. But I, I, I believe that the main thing is, is be prepared to study to show thyself approved and be ready and come to the pulpit and then let the Spirit of God speak through you as He gives the utterance. And so in Romans chapter 3 and verse, uh, verse let's start at verse 22. And for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, who God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood, to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins of the past through the forbearance of God. Now I just want us to, first of all, tonight I want to use that because I'll be coming back to that, but I wanted to share something with you as well tonight that uh, last year, Somewhere in the time, I can't remember exactly, but somewhere in the time of around August, I, I imagine it was. And I, matter of fact, I was praying and I was heavily burdened for a friend of mine. And I come home from work and I was praying for this person, deeply burdened for this person. I, I don't know what, what what was taking place in their life or what was about to take place, but I really felt like 
God was saying, you need to pray for this person. The person is very urgent. So as I begin to pray for this person, and as I begin to enter into the Spirit of God, and the Spirit of God begin to move on me, and the presence of God begin to be manifested uh, there in my living room, my house, and uh, the power of God began to come upon me in a very unusual way, in a very different way. And the presence of God began to move upon me, and it was like that I was in the presence of, uh, like, oil dripping down from heaven. And it was like I was inside of it, and encapsulated inside of a bubble. And as I, as I was praying in the Spirit, God began to show me that there was black clouds arising, coming toward us. And as I, I began to see that, God spoke to me and said, there's evil that's coming. And it's, it's a, the, the evil that's coming is a tremendous evil that's coming up on the land. And this was, uh, I, you know, during the, uh, the time that we begin to hear more about ISIS and begin to hear about the Ebola, uh, uh, Ebola virus and all that, so I thought maybe that uh, maybe that's what God is is warning about and, and talking about that this thing's going to intensify, which we see that that uh, ISIS has intensified. But uh, also, uh, God didn't tell me exactly, per se, what it was that, uh, that He was showing me. He just said to me, there is evil that's coming. Evil that is beyond uh, comprehension that's coming upon the land. And God began to speak to me, and He began to tell me, and He, he reminded me of the Word of God, of first, Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, of my people, which are called by my name, would humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven, I will forgive their sins, and I will heal their land. And so God touched me, and He spoke to me through the Word of God. And then God began to speak to me about uh, in Jeremiah chapter uh, chapter uh, tw two and thirteen. He said, "For my people have committed two evils; for they have forsaken <coughs> the fountain of living water, and they hewed out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water." And then God spoke to me uh, about uh, how that we need to return back to the old paths and, uh, from uh, uh, Jeremiah chapter 6 that God says that He wants us to return to the old paths and, and, uh, and consider our ways and to return and begin to walk in the path of the Lord and we shall find rest for our souls. Amen. God tonight that he's, that he's given us the invitation and uh, giving us the, the remedy for the problem. Amen? Amen? You see, but our nation must receive the Word of God. Our nation must hear what thus saith the Lord. And I believe we need a revival in America from the White House to the outhouse. Amen? Amen. when he told him, Joel said uh, to sound, blow the trumpet and sound the alarm and call my people together. He began yes. to call, tell him to call the, the people together to assemble and pray and fast and seek the face of God. And he said uh, two times he, he, uh, he urged uh, Joel to call, to blow the trumpet for the people to come together and begin to pray as one and begin to seek God and he, he assured us uh, in the scriptures that he would hold back the evil that was coming. Amen? Amen. I think the book of Joel talks about evil in his day but also it goes on all the way up to the, to the battle of Armageddon so he spans a lot of territory in what he's uh, prophesying and what he's seeing. And I want you to know that God is speaking to us tonight the same way as he spoke through, Jeremiah, through Joel the prophet. And he's still speaking tonight. And he's saying, sound the alarm. Watch for the wall. Sound the alarm. Amen. He's got to watch for us to get the one of the people that Jesus Christ is coming. And he's looking for a people that's been made wide in the blood of the Lamb. Amen. Hallelujah. And I believe that we must be 
ready for what is coming upon us in this day and age in which we live. We must be prepared for the Lord Jesus Christ. We must be prepared to withstand the adversities and the evil of our day. Now, I know that uh, we, live in a, we live in perilous times. The Bible said that, we, that in the last days, uh, he says there will be a falling away. He says in the last days that there would be deceivers that would come and that lead many people away from God. He tells us that there would be a time that men would have a form of godliness but deny the power thereof and such turn away. I was telling Teresa just the other day, uh, we were watching something on television. I said, you know what? We live in an hour where you better have the Holy Ghost. You better walk close to God. You'll be deceived. Better be sensitive to God because there are things that are that are uh, that are at, at work in our world that if we are not careful, even could deceive the very elect. So we need to be we need to be close to God and we need to stay near to Him. So I want to share with you tonight about the grace of God. I want to talk to you about what we need in this hour. In this hour in which we live, we need the operation of God's grace. And first of all, I want us to notice how that the Word of God in our text tonight tells us that our position in God is, is that we have been justified by the grace of God. And so I want you to know that first of all, the remedy for our world is to be put right with God. The remedy for our society is to be put right with God. This is not, the answer does not lie in the, in, in the political arena. The answer does not lie in our military might. But the answer for our problem lies in Jesus Christ, the one who died for us on the cross of Calvary, the one who suffered and died that we might be saved by the grace of God. God says in His Word, justified freely by His grace. For we are saved by grace, Ephesians 2 and 5 says. And then in Ephesians 8 and 9, He says that it's by the grace of God through faith. And that it's the gift of God. And it's not of works that any man should boast. I want you to know that in order to be right with God and experience the grace of God, one must be put in a right relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ alone. Amen. Amen. Jesus Christ alone. He is our answer. That word justified means just as if I'd never sinned. God takes me by His grace. The grace, is a, grace is a wonderful word. That He makes us righteous. And through His grace, uh, the word righteous just simply means to be put right. To be put right with God. The justification means to just be looked upon just as if we never see it. Why? Because of the blood of Jesus and the grace of God has been extended under our lives. And so I thank God tonight that we have a, a, a gift that's been provided to us through Jesus Christ and we can know the grace of God. You see, this world don't understand the grace of God. And I, I'm afraid a lot of people in the church don't understand the grace of God. See, there's a lot of different opinions as to what grace is. But I want us to know that the grace of God that comes down from God is real. Amen? Yeah. God's grace is real and God's grace is awesome and powerful. Now, the, in the Greek, the original Greek word for grace in the New Testament is, is uh, charis. And then uh, there's another word that is a conjunction of that word which is uh, charis rule, which means rejoice. But also this is the root word that we get the word charismatic, which involves the nine gifts of the Spirit. I was, oh, hallelujah. I want you to know that it's the grace of God that's at work in the church. upon us freely by the grace of God. Now I want us also notice that we have been made free from sin by the grace of God. Listen to what he says. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. I thank God that sin's power is broken. Those that are bound, those that are bound by sin can be free. 
free of the grace of God. You see, we can't free ourselves. It's we only deceive in ourselves. You see, many people in the world they think that they can do it. They can do in their lives uh, what needs to be done, but you can't. It takes God. It takes the power of God that can set you free and to break the power and the chains of darkness upon your life. It takes, it takes the grace of God to set you free. And so the grace of God much more abounds. So where sin is active in a person's life, when they come to Jesus and receive His grace, then sin is broken off of their lives. And the power of God's grace sets them free from the power of sin. Right. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Romans 6 and 14, sin shall have no more dominion over you. For you're not under the law, but under grace. I want us to focus on that. We are, we are to walk under the dominion of God's grace. You cannot try to be a good person. You cannot try to achieve a, a favor with God. You, can, you know in reality, we are our own efforts to be put right with God is the same as a, as a filthy rain. Did you did it, think about it? The try to bypass Jesus and the cross, the try to go around and go into the presence of God, is to be a stench in the nostrils of God. It's a stench in the nostrils of God. So we, we must come through the cross of Jesus. As we come to Jesus and as we bow at the old rugged cross, there we find forgiveness. There we find cleansing in the blood. There we find healing in our soul. There we find deliverance in the power of God's grace sets the captive free. Hallelujah. For where sin abound in grace now much more abounds. Hallelujah. Whatever you're dealing with in your life, you may be a Christian, but something you're dealing with, I want you to know that the grace of God, let the grace of God have His perfect work in you. Yes. Hallelujah. I, I read an article a few days ago that said that of all the people that confess to be Christians in America, this individual writing the article said that he sincerely believed only 2% of those was actually truly born again. And I'm inclined to believe that could be true. I'm inclined to believe that there is a lot of people that have never really had an encounter with Jesus Christ and the power of His grace. Because the power of God's grace will change your life. The power of God's grace will set you free. And you will be delivered from the powers of darkness. I want us to notice also in the writings of, turn over with me the writings of Zechariah uh, and the fourth chapter in Zechariah. He's the, he's the prophet that's in the time of Nehemiah, in the time of Esther, uh, or, uh, Ezra, and, uh, and, and Haggai, the other prophet. And he is talking about the rebuilding. And, and Israel had come back out of bondage and he had come back into... Uh, the promised land and everything was in shambles and everything was in disarray and so they had to depend upon the grace of God. Now notice with me in Zechariah chapter 4 and verse 6 and verse 7 we find that the prophet says this, then he answered and spake unto me saying, this is the word of the Lord unto Jeremiah saying not by might, not by power, but by my spirit saith the Lord. Hallelujah. I want you to know this is the power of the Spirit of grace in our lives. If we're going to achieve anything, if we're going to accomplish anything, it's going to be by the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. The grace of God in the name of Jesus Christ. He says, Who thou, who art thou, O great mountain? Behold, Jeroboam, thou shalt become a plain, and he shall bring forth the headstone thereof with shouting, crying, grace, grace, Unto it. Amen. Amen. 
the grace of God. You see, he's faced with much. If you've read about the coming back out of captivity, you know all the opposition from those that were around them. And there was much opposition to the, to the uh, rebuilding and restoring of the city of Jerusalem. But God says grace will get the job done. What no man can do. Turn with me over to the writings of, of uh, Ephesians, the uh, second chapter. Ephesians chapter 2. I want you to notice that he talks about the head, the uh, capstone, and then here he talks about in chapter 2 of Ephesians, he talks about in verse 19 and verse 22, he says, Now therefore, Ye are no more strangers and foreigners and fellow citizens with the saints of the household of God and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ Himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building fitly framed together grow up into a holy temple in the Lord in whom ye also are built together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. Now I want you to notice here that he's talking about in the writings of Zechariah, he's talking about the capstone, which is on top. And then here Paul's talking about the, the, the cornerstone. And, and when I was reading about this today, I began to read something that really, that really struck, stuck in my mind. It was that he said that the magistrate was the one who set the, uh, the, the cornerstone, and the magistrate also was the one who set the capstone. And you know what? I felt God speak to my heart. We've got to begin in God's grace. And we've got to finish in God's grace. Amen? What, what, is, what we started in, we've got to finish in it. Amen? Whosoever has begun in the grace of the Lord, let us finish in the grace of God Almighty. Amen? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Too many times we start out, we did run well, but who did hinder us? Amen? We, sometimes we get distracted along the way. We get hindered along the way. We start out in the grace of God. And God's grace is so real in our lives. And somewhere in our journey, somewhere in our way, we seem to find ourselves losing, as it were, uh, losing, as it were, our relationship with God and His grace. Beginning to stray from His blessings and from His presence. And I want you to know that we've got to make it into the end. We're not there yet. Amen? Right. Amen. Amen. We're not there yet. Let us run the race with patience that's set before us. We started out in the grace of God. Let us get up every day and run this race in the grace of God. Amen? Every day let us get up and prepare to run this race in the grace of God. Right. Amen. Hallelujah. You see, the grace of God is something that is not a one-time, it's not a one-time thing. Grace is not something that we come to God and we perceive and, and we, uh, we, we like, we enjoy the blessing, as it were, of the, the power and the touch of God. He makes us to sit in heavenly places and taste of the power of the world, of God, of, of the world uh, to come and we taste the power of God. But uh, then we, well, we can't live on that for, uh, for the next day. It's like the manna. The manna, they went out and picked it up and they eat it and they were blessed, but you couldn't go back and eat it the next day. Amen? You couldn't go back and eat the next day. You had to go out and do it all over again. What am I saying? I'm saying that we need to come every day and pick up the manna of God's grace. Every day, pick up the manna of God's grace. That we may make it another day. That we may find provision for our soul for another day. And the next day, get up and do the same thing. Start out in the grace of God. Hallelujah. Praise God forever. Hallelujah. Romans chapter 8 and verse 26. Turn over there with me. I know I've got a lot of scriptures here tonight, but I like the Word of God, don't you? <laughs> I like the Word of God because the Word of God is it cleanses us. It washes us. It's, uh, it's bread. Amen. It's meat. Hallelujah. It's strength. It's the Word that we take that Word and we defeat the devil with the Word of God. Hallelujah. In Romans chapter 8, verse 26, he says, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. 
For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself make of intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because he make of intercession for the saints according to the will of God. I want you to notice that, that he says that we can make it by the Spirit of grace within us, that, that he is there to help us to pray. You ever been in that place where you didn't know how to pray? You ever been in that place where you just felt the burden? You didn't know what to do? God says, I put my spirit of grace in you to intercede for you. I give you my spirit of grace. I give you grace. And then through my spirit of grace, I'm gonna help, I'm gonna make intercession for you. I'm gonna I'm gonna help you in your in your struggle. I'm gonna help you in your in this in this situation that you're in. Hallelujah. I thank God tonight that we can we can we can be filled with the spirit of God's grace and that we can overcome by the grace of God. Yeah. I want to say something right here. I, I, I feel that that is important to be said that that as we start out in the grace of God, those as as we know the Word of God, as we become knowledgeable of the Word of God, but yet we don't we don't act on the Word of God, then that's dangerous. It's dangerous for us to know the Word and not act on the Word. And my point is this: talking about the Spirit of God, you helping us, you interceding for us. I, I pray tonight as we see that talking about the grace of God, the hour in which we live. I want to refresh your mind of that, that the things that we the day and hour we live, the perilous times we live in, the, the, the times, the situation that we're in, uh, in this in this struggle, in this hour, that we need that we need the grace of God that is that is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. And what am I saying? I'm saying this for one thing is if you've not yet received the Holy Ghost baptism, what are you waiting on? If you've not been baptized in the Holy Ghost, what in the world are you waiting on? Because it ain't going to get any better. This, this, the child of God needs the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I believe that. I believe that, that if a person has that knowledge, it is not enough to come to the altar and repent of your sins and ask God to justify you by His grace and to put you in the right relationship with God. It's not enough. It's not enough to do that in light of what you know. In the light of what you know. Because Jesus said, Tari, to you be in view with power. Amen. He said, Tari. He said it to the believer, not the world. He said to the believer, Tired to you in you with power from on high. Amen. He's Amen. calling us as believers to get filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen. If you receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, but the Holy Ghost is not active in your life, not flowing in your life, you need the Holy Ghost to refill you. Remember the, the scripture I read earlier that God showed me about the time, the perilous times, and the evil that's coming on the world? And that uh, in Jeremiah, he says, My people have forsaken me. They have forsaken me. The fountain of living water and giving them out cisterns, broken cisterns, which can help hold no water. How many knows you've got a word to be with that dig a cistern? Right. How many knows that ain't going to save you? Amen. And, and then it won't work when you do build it. It's full of stagnant water. Oh, hallelujah. I want you to know that the Holy Ghost is leaving water. Amen. Moving water. Yeah. Moving water. It's not standing like the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is moving. Hallelujah. Yes. I remember when my father dug a well in East Tennessee. They said that we hit living water. I said, what does that mean? He says it's like an underground river. He said it's moving. Hallelujah. I want you to know we need to tap in. We need to tap in for the grace of God. Amen? Yes, yes. We need to tap in for the grace of God where we hit that fountain of living water. Too many people are going to hit to need a sister that will hold no water. <laughs> Church that's a sister that's broken and hold no water, all it is is religious practice. A church that has only, has a, a church that is a sister that's broken, is stagnant.
stagnant. It's not fresh. It's stale. There's no life there. It's just all form and fashion and ritual. But when the church taps in to the living water, the living water of grace, the Holy Ghost, hallelujah, when the church taps in, hallelujah, when the church by faith, when the church by faith holds her on and gets a hold of the living water, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Reach out in faith until you receive it. Amen. Amen. Reach out until you get a hold of it. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God forever and forever. In uh, Romans chapter 8 and verse 9, he says, But you are not in the flesh, but you are in the Spirit. And so the Spirit of God will in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. It's important that we operate in the Spirit of God. It's very important that we operate in the Spirit of God. Hallelujah. And then I want us to look tonight also at the grace of God as it operates in our lives. First of all, the grace of God. The Bible tells us that we are to grow in this grace in 2 Peter 3 and 18. Which just simply means that we receive spiritual strength day by day. It's a growing process, but it's a strengthening. Amen? Amen. You take a person that lifts weights. They lift them weights and they begin to see them get them bigger and stronger. A little bit more, more and more strength. It's because they're, they're growing in strength. Because they're dedicated to something. They're committed to something. I say the church needs to be dedicated. Yeah. Right. I say the church needs to be committed. The church needs to be committed. The church needs to pray and seek God. The church needs to find a prayer closet and call on the name of the Lord and let God move in your life and in your heart and in your home and let God strengthen you for the battle that's ahead of you. We don't know, we don't know what we will have to face tomorrow, next week, this month, next year. We don't know. We don't know Jesus could come today. We don't know. But as long as we're on this earth, we don't know what we're going to face. We don't know what what uh, what things is going to take place that we may once we're in, in it, we may we may be saying, "What in the world is going on?" That's where we need to be strong in the grace of God. That's where we need to be ready. Amen. We need to be ready. Amen. Amen. We need to be ready for whatever we're faced with. We need to be ready. And the Bible tells us that we can experience the riches of God's grace in Ephesians 2 and 7. He's talking about the, 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 the riches of God. When, when, you, when you're in Christ Jesus, we are heir and join heir with Christ. And all that belongs to, to Christ in God the Father is ours. Amen? It's ours. We are recipients of of the gift of God and the grace of God and we are recipients of what the kingdom of God has to offer us. Amen. We, we are, we're not pumpers. We're not beggars. But we have a heavenly Father that owns a cattle of a thousand eagles and ever tainer of it. Amen. Amen. We have a God who stands ready to provide for His children and the grace of God is no different. His grace is rich. Amen. The richness of His grace. Amen. Matter of fact, the writer Paul said in, in, the, in the writings of Ephesians chapter 2 verse 7, he talks about God using us as an example to show others the riches of God's grace and kindness. Amen. Amen. On display. God says, look, look at my church. Look at my church walking in the grace of God. Look at my church walking in, in my grace. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I want to be in the ranks of that, don't you? Amen. I want to be in the ranks of that for the angels in heaven. Say, look at God's church walking in the grace of God. Amen. And one of them looks at and says, I don't understand. I wish I did. Amen. One angel may look and he says, Boy, I wish I could just comprehend what that is. But you see, only humanity can comprehend the grace of God. When Jesus died on that cross, He didn't die for an angel. He died for us. Amen? Amen. He died for us. He loved us that much that He, that he
that He gave His life that we might be saved. And so we are growing in the riches of His grace and we are, we are experiencing the, the relationship with Jesus Christ as being an heir with Christ, a joint heir with God. So we are heirs of the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. I want us to notice also that grace means that God will withhold no good thing from us in Psalms 84 and 11. God will by His grace, He will not hold any good thing from you. Right. What did Jesus say? Right. Jesus said, Will a father, if his son asks for bread, will he give him a rock? If his son asks for a fish, will he give him a scorpion? What's that say about Jesus? What's that say about our Heavenly Father? It says He knows how to give us good and perfect gifts. Amen. Amen. So, what is it you need tonight? What is it you need? What is it you need God to do in your life tonight? Because I want you to know He's here to do it in your life. Yes, yes. All you have to do, maybe the devil's already working in your mind saying, God, it's not going to do nothing for you. Why don't you know it's written in the Word of God? Whosoever will be the way to come. I want you to know it's written in the Word of God that Jesus Christ died to save the sinner. For God says in His Word in John 3 and 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever should believe upon Him should ever have everlasting life. Hallelujah. And should not perish, but live. Hallelujah. Right. Amen. Right. Hallelujah. Think about what, what Jesus has provided for us tonight. Jesus by His grace. If we only humble ourselves. Humble ourselves and receive the grace of God. Listen to what the first Peter 5 and 5 says that we receive this grace through humility. As we humble ourselves before God. Jesus said, He that exalted himself shall be abased. But God says we'll humble ourselves before God. Then He is going to bestow upon His, His grace upon the humble. All we have to do is humble ourselves before Him and say, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. Or, Lord Jesus, I, 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 I've allowed the enemy to creep into my life. And uh, Whatever the situation, whatever the situation might be, if we can just simply come to the Lord and humble ourselves before the Lord and say, Lord, forgive me. I repent. I turn to You. And I ask, Lord, that You would restore the love and the grace back into my life that I've walked away from. Now listen to what he says also in the in Zechariah chapter 4 verse 7 again, just repeating on that. He says, the mountains shall make faith flat by the grace of God. Grace, grace. The obstacles by the grace of God are leveled like a flame. The grace of God there, the Bible says in Hebrews 4 and 16 that we come to God and we come boldly to walk the throne of grace. Hallelujah. You see, if you don't have Jesus, then you know what you find? I probably do. Because in the tabernacle, in the wilderness, in the tabernacle, and inside the temple of God, and, the, and behind the veil was the Ark of the Covenant, and underneath that mercy seat that was stained by the blood of animals slain, inside of that was the broken law of God. But the blood upon it, Jesus is our mercy seat. Yeah. Right. Jesus is the one who covers us. And God, when He looks upon us, He does not see the broken law. He sees the blood of Jesus. Right. Hallelujah. So He says, Come boldly unto the throne of grace, that you may obtain grace and find mercy and help in the time of need. Hallelujah. Praise God. And then He says, The grace of God is sufficient. I think of what, what Paul said when he prayed, in 2 Corinthians, he tells us that when he had prayed and asked God, he talks about how he prayed and asked God to remove the thorn from his flesh. And he prayed three times and asked God to, to heal him. And God said, Oh, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Right. We don't understand the, the mind of God or the ways of God necessarily in every situation. But God, the thing I like about it is God says, My grace is sufficient. My grace is enough for you. My grace is enough for you. God's grace is enough for us tonight. Hallelujah. Praise be unto the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. 
I want us just to look tonight at what I found some things about the grace of God. The grace of God empowers us with the presence of God. Enables us to uh, enables us to be who He wants us to be, and to do what He has called us to do. Grace gives us the desire and the power that God gives us to do His will. It's through the grace of God that we find forgiveness and the gift of eternal life. It's through His grace that we have the powers of sin broken upon our lives. It's through the grace of God that works in us that we can be transformed by the power of God. I think of I think I, I think of grace as being in our lives as a metamorphosis. Like that caterpillar gets in that cocoon and then he comes out as a beautiful butterfly. It's like a metamorphosis. And so what I'm saying is, is that God, through his grace, we can become a new creation in Christ Jesus. That's right. It's more than just a change. It's more than that. It's more than that. A lot of people try to change. Think about it. There's a lot of people say they've changed. But you see what we really need is a metamorphosis in God's grace. That's what's going to bring, that's what's going to bring, uh, to make a difference in our life. Now, regeneration. And also, uh, we experience transformation. And we are, we are uh, led to a place of repentance. And we experience renewal in the power of God. I want you to think about that with me tonight. That God, by His grace, transforms you. God, by His grace, He renews you. He gives you a renewal. He brings, uh, he brings regeneration in your being. He brings a, a transformation to you that only God can bring. Hallelujah. Amen. You won't get that from a self-help book. You won't get that from a self-help tape. You won't get that from some psychologist or somebody of that nature, but you can find it at the cross of Calvary. Right. Hallelujah. You want to get a metamorphosis in your life? Then come to the cross of Calvary. You want to experience the transformation that only God can bring? Then come to the cross of Calvary. I think of John Newton when he wrote that song, Amazing Grace. And when you look at the life of this man, he was a slave trader. A very base, base and very vile man. If you've ever read this story, it's amazing. But here's a man that was dealing in slavery, and brutality, and very base and very vile. But yet he come to the place where he met Jesus. And when he met Jesus, he penned the words to the song, Amazing Grace. He talked about what a wretch he was. And I want us to sing that song tonight and close it tonight. Because he said, he said I was a wretch. But the grace of God. The grace of God has changed my life and transformed me. He's, when you read what he says, it's hard to believe. When, when you read the story of John Newton, you think that seems, that seems so impossible. But that's what the power of God can do in your life. That's what the power of God can do in your life. And God can change and transform the life. And it's, like, it's a literal metamorphosis and transformation that he brings about in your life. The grace of God, it can do... It, it does what we cannot do in ourselves. The grace of God. You remember when Moses in the wilderness, the people were thirsty, the, the animals were thirsty, it was dry and barren. And the Bible says that Moses struck the rock and Paul said that rock was Jesus. The fountain of living water flowed up from that place. If you're a parched and dry and barren place, I want you to know that the rock has already been struck on the cross of the cross of the And I want you to know that the grace is flowing. The living water of God's grace is flowing right now in this service. And God's saying, come and receive. Come and drink. Come and partake. Come unto me without money, without price. Come and drink freely of His grace tonight. Amen. He stands ready tonight.
to, to give His grace on you. He stands ready to bestow upon you something that you can't buy. If you owned everything in this earth, you could buy the grace of God. It would be as nothing. Amen? You could own everything. You could own it all. And you could come and bring before God and say, God, is this enough? God will look at you as if it's nothing. But you see, when we come through the blood of Jesus, it's a sweet smelling aroma. It's a sweet smelling fragrance. It's pleasing to God. God delights in it. Because we're coming through Jesus and through yeah. grace. There we find fellowship with God. Fellowship with the Father. Fellowship with the Son. Fellowship in the Holy Ghost. And I want you to know tonight, whatever you need tonight, you need to be saved. You need to be born again. Become a disciple. You need to, you need to be restored. You're, maybe you're cold, indifferent. Maybe you're lukewarm. Whatever the case may be, come and drink from the grace of God tonight. Right. You're here tonight, and you, you need God to sanctify you. Body, soul, and spirit, come and partake of His grace tonight. You're here tonight, and you, and you need the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Come and partake of His grace tonight. Come and let Him fuel you. Let this be the beginning point of your search for the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Let this be the start tonight of your journey to seek God for the infilling of the Holy Ghost. Let God know tonight you're serious about this business and that you're going to pray and you're going to seek God and that you get baptized in the Holy Ghost. How hungry, how much do you want the baptism of the Holy Ghost? How bad do you want it tonight? How bad do you want the grace of God to be set, to be loosened in your life? How bad do you want God's grace to be manifested? What are you going through tonight? God will give you grace. Amen. You got family problems, let God's grace intervene in it. You got problems on your job, let God's grace intervene in it. You got a financial problem, let God's grace intervene in it tonight. How many know what I'm talking about? Is there a witness in this house? Somebody witness in this place and say, I know what it is. I know what it is. How many right now, I want somebody to come to the piano and begin the same amazing grace. That's all standing in this place tonight. If we get bowed and bright clothes and if as the church prays, as you pray and seek God tonight, I pray tonight that someone in this place, that God has spoken unto you. God wants you to know He loves you. God wants you to know He loves you so much that He gave His only begotten Son for you. Jesus died for you. That's how much He loves you. Jesus cares for you tonight. Will you come to Jesus tonight? Will you come to Jesus tonight? Let God do in your life. I don't know what you need. I don't know what your situation is. I don't know what's going on in your life, but you're just simply saying, I need God's grace. Yes. I need God's grace. Tonight. How many of us step out of your seat as they say, come to this altar? It don't matter what people think around you, just come and say, I need the grace of God in my life. It's between me and God, and I need grace. How many of you have come tonight to let God's grace impact your life?